Okay, hi everyone. Hey, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Merritt, and with me is a woman who is a shoe in for the role of Bonnie in the remake of The Craft, Kara Ellison. Oh, thank you. I yeah. So we, it's Friday the Thirteenth. So obviously, um, sex witches, sex witches, um, uh, sex witch. It sounds like a really good sort of alternate Ooh, yeah. for a sandwich. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, kind of uh, probably health hazards though. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we are going to talk about sex and games. Uh, this was animated, but we only just barely pulled it together. So imagine those two machines having sex with each other, rendering human beings totally obsolete. <laughs> So a couple of caveats before we get going. We're focusing on small, single-player digital games. There's tons of really cool stuff happening in multiplayer and analog games, obviously. If you haven't played Consentacle upstairs, you should go do that after this. But we've only got 20 minutes, so, you know, we made our call and we're sticking with it. Yeah, so we're just going to, like, have, a, like, a really, really quick, sort of a quickie, if you will. Um. We want to talk real, real quick about just, like, give a context of, like, the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about. So we're mostly going to be talking about really weird stuff happening on the fringes that probably most people are less aware of than sort of mainstream games. So up here we've got uh, mainstream games on the left that are doing kind of cool things around sex. So we've got uh, Shadow of Mordor, which maybe you might not think of as being about sex, but there's an interesting case to be made for that that Kara will go into in a bit. Uh, of course, Mass Effect, and then Wolfenstein, which is a kind of big-budget recent game that had a very visible sex scene. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, on the right-hand side, we've got um, uh, <laughs> Coming Out on Top. At the top there, uh, the men of Coming Out on Top are uh, excellent and hunky, and um, it's a gay dating sim, uh, Western dating, dating sim, which is excellent, by the way. And um, this, the second one down is um, a game about pornography that um, my friend Holly Gramazio made um, to do with the... Uh, Pornography, new pornography laws in the UK, which apparently uh, you're not allowed to wee on a boob uh, now in uh, UK pornography. So she made a game exploring those issues. And that one at the bottom is um, very self-aggrandizing, but it's uh, my game Sacrilege, which is about um, going to a club and fucking some dudes. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, there are interesting things happening in mainstream big-budget games. Like, very slowly, oh, like, we're starting to see gay sex. We're starting to see... Uh, games like Shadow of Mortar, which have this weird kind of undercurrent of like homosexual intimacy to them. Um, but when it, it turns out that when people get their hands on accessible tools to make games, a lot of them are about sex. Um, and whether this is just because people are, you know, interested in the topic or because mainstream games have sort of yet to really catch up um, to doing interesting things with it, um, for whatever reason, there are a lot of tiny weird games about sex. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of cool because um, like the tiny weird games are happening because um, a lot of these tools to make games are like now like sort of open source or free. Um, like I made um, Sacrilege and Twine, which is uh, like I think if you saw um, Liz's talk earlier, it's it's a free, uh, like a, a hypertext um, game engine, which is like really powerful and amazing. And, um, and you know, because it's free and then it's also free to like publish whatever you want on the internet, like you were seeing a lot more of these like really radical, interesting sex games that, um, that are like super exciting because, you know, there's no restrictions on them because you don't have to publish them on like a platform like Steam. So there's no like, you know, censoring going on there, which is really amazing. Um, so yeah, and then uh, obviously, there are a lot of um, other engines like Game Maker um, where you can like make a, make a game about sex and I think that I think maybe Holly made her game in uh, Game Maker so it's kind of exciting like just because there's like less censorship because of like the freeness of stuff and like the internet and yay yeah and it, well it's interesting there's a really great Kotaku article a few weeks ago about the challenges that uh, people who make dating sims have in getting their games on Steam and just sort of making censored versions and um, if you think about the context of uh, hatred um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with the game, um, but it's basically just like an incredibly gruesome, horrible, um, racist, awful first-person shooter. And games like that have an easy time getting on Steam and games about consensual sex with nudity, which raises really interesting questions around like what kinds of things we're censoring in games. Yeah, exactly. There's still like a lot of um, discomfort, you know, with um, sex, even consensual sex and violence. And actually, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the fact that like. Uh, Hotline Miami, I think, had like a kind of pseudo rape scene uh, in it, and people are even more, uh, you know, comfortable with rape being in their games, like sexual violence, than actual consensual sex. Um, so, because you know, I don't think that um, coming out on top is actually on Steam, and I think they would have a really hard time, hard time, getting on, <laughs> getting on Steam, right? So. Um, there's a little, yeah, there's a lot of hardness and hardness in that game. Anyway, um, so yeah, so it's kind of interesting that we're um, experiencing like this like kind of weird censorship of like sexual content rather than violence. Um, so yeah. 
Yeah, should we move on to talk about consent now that we're on Let's the topic? Let's talk about yeah, consent. Yeah, Tony, would you please? <laughs> cool. Um, so this, this butt is from um, Robert Yang's game, uh, Hurt Me Plenty, which is a reference to the Doom difficulty setting. Um, and so Robert's game, I think, raises some interesting questions about consent in the context of, of games and sex. Um, because I think we can talk about consent as like how is consent represented between characters in a game, but it's interesting too to think about consent between a player and a designer or consent between player and a game itself. So in Robert's game, um, he says that it's best to be played in a public setting and um, what happens is you're sort of spanking this guy's ass. Um, he's asked you to do it and you're just sort of hitting him and um, if you go too hard and he safe words and he basically says stop and you disregard that, the game locks you out for like a set amount of time. Um, and you can't get back in. So the game is basically denying you access to it because you violated the rules that you set going in, which I think is a really interesting step. Yeah, it's really cool. And like actually when you're negotiating, um, like in the beginning it's like a, neg a consent nego negotiation. So you have to both agree and then shake on the terms. So like if you want to slap this guy's ass like super hard, then you have to say in the beginning, I want it to be like super hard. And then you also have to like um, agree and like shake, like physically shake on like the fact that like the safe what the safe word is and when he says the safe word you should stop and if you don't stop yeah like Merritt says you're locked out so it's a super interesting interpretation of how to actually um, go about um, having sex with someone it's great it's healthy it's lovely um, and also um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, yeah creatures such as we which is a really amazing uh, text game um, that was made for the um, Text game festival, super, uh, super popular. I can't remember the name of it now. IFK. Um, and yeah, and it's a really amazing game because it actually addresses the issue of like how the player uh, and um, player characters negotiate con like con sexual consent or relationships or that sort of thing. Um, and it's really interesting because it goes, it kind of um, explores the relationship. Um, between the player and characters, whether there can be any consent, like actually negotiated in terms of um, essentially in dating sims, what you can do is like if you don't like get uh, get to sleep with a character, um, then you can just kind of go back and then renegotiate to see if you can sleep with that character, kind of like in Groundhog Day, maybe not really like Groundhog Day, but you know what I mean. It's kind of like it's kind of like you c you you can uh, test the boundaries of this character and like the dialogue options, and you can sort of like redo it if you don't get to sleep with them unless unless the character is like someone who you cannot literally romance so um, it's really interesting to play that play through that game because those issues are brought up and um, because the characters are very self-aware um, so it's excellent so you could also uh, uh, try that out and see what you think of it um, and Tony if you could please uh, another game that does interesting things around the same kind of uh, topic as creatures such as we is uh, this Japanese dating sim called uh, Kimi Tokenojo no Kanoko no Koi. Um, basically, this is a game. So the scene right here, and I'm sorry, this is going to be gratuitous spoilers. Um, basically, what this game does that's really interesting is separate out the player from the player character. Um, and the whole conceit of the game is that one of the virtual novel characters has sort of gained self-awareness. And um, after you've played through the game one time and you go back to play again and, and romance someone else, she remembers that you made a vow of undying love to her. Um, not the player character, but you the player. And then what happens is like later on in another route of the game, she um, goes what's called in the industry yandere um, and <laughs> murders everyone um, and then starts talking to you, the player character, like stares you dead in the eye through the screen and just says like, you promised that you'd be with me forever and then basically goes on to delete all of your saves, rewrite the game so that you can only ever romance her. Um, and just sort of take it over. And it's really interesting because, yeah, it's like this kind of thing can be played for cheap laughs or like horror or whatever, but I think it really speaks to the ways that if we think about games as just like interactions between players who are real people with agency and non-player characters, there's limits in the kinds of conversations that we can have around consent and agency because it's not a, a, uh, an interaction between two autonomous beings. And so this game kind of plays with that a little and says like, actually, no, you don't get to just do whatever you want. You don't get to just like, go back and romance everyone. There are consequences for those actions. I mean, there are some sort of explorations of this in like um, big budget games as well. I mean, I know that um, I was recently playing Fallout New Vegas and like I tried to romance 
this person and they were like no I'm gay sorry bye and it was kind of cool to experience that because like usually characters don't do that because everyone's around to be like a resource for you and you can like sleep with whoever you like because that's the power fantasy but these games are like super interesting because they actually play with that idea a lot more yeah so should we move on to talk about intimacy because we're sort of going talk in the direction Shall we? thank you okay um so this is a game um oh god I, I forget her name, but she's like really smart and attractive. Um, <laughs> I uh, I think it might be you, Mara. Oh oh oh. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. So this is a game called Consensual Torture Simulator. I made a year and a half or two years ago. Um, and basically, what I was trying to do in this game was depict a consensual, intimate relationship between two people where there's a, an explicit power dynamic involved. Um, and so you sort of like play through this game and your goal is to make this other character cry by hitting her enough and she's like said that that's what she wants to happen. And a really interesting thing happened when I released this game is that a lot of people told me in any other game I would have pushed and pushed and tested the bounds of the system um, and sort of approached it in a really um, utilitarian way. But in this game, people were, got so invested in the narrative that they backed off really quickly and they didn't want to see what would happen if they they didn't, didn't want to find out if there was a fail state because they were too wrapped up in it. And that to me is like a really compelling thing because it doesn't happen very often in games. We usually are approaching non-player characters like resources, right? Yeah, and I, I think that it works, like this is such a powerful um, game, Merit, it's, it's a powerful game. Because um, I feel like it, if you use text, I think everything is happening in your head and it's a lot more, like the experience of the, like, playing this game is a lot more intimate for some really, uh, I don't know, strange psychological reason. And I feel like um, when you're playing this, like I too kind of was like, I don't really want to uh, hurt, like test this person's boundaries. I don't want to kind of go out of like, you know, my own comfort zone with this. And I, I you know, I, I kind of felt like I was really being tested as a player and not many games try to test your, uh, I guess, intimacy level with anything. And, um, and I think that's like, this, this game is incredibly good at testing that. And um, it's um, the tension, you can feel the tension between um, like what you want to do, what you, what you want to find out and also like your own like, I, I guess, moral stance, which is really amazing. So yeah. Um, so this is a game called Gone Home that uh, hopefully most people are familiar with. Um, and we're sort of moving away from explicit talk about sexuality, but into sort of thinking about ways that like players can experience intimacy through games. Um, and so Gone Home, uh, people, a lot of people have talked about this, but it does this interesting trick where instead of trying to animate people and with all of the weird Uncanny Valley stuff that comes with that, it just removes people from the equation entirely and um, just has you interact with them solely through their possessions and things they've written. Um, and I think the result is that you feel a sense of intimacy um, with the space and with the people around you. And um, Kara, you have like a really interesting story about the way that the mechanic of yeah. picking things up works. So right? like, um, it's it's uh, I've interviewed Steve, Steve Vayner a few times about this game, and he said that was one really interesting thing they find in, like early playtesting of, of the Gone Home, which was um, essentially because your um, the sis like the sister or your family member who belongs in this house. Um, like because you're not like playing a role of someone who's like a straight like a stranger. Um, usually in video games you play like the kind of detective role, um, and you're a stranger and you're investigating other people's like business. But actually in this is like you're investigating a place that you already belong. And so whenever you pick up an object in this game, uh, you feel like it's an object that is like belongs in your own house and so what happens is like people will pick up an object and initially like the system worked like you could just like you would just like drop the object when you let go of it and it would just like drop on the floor and like people he found were, were spending ages and ages trying to pick it up and then put it back where it belonged because it's their house you don't go around your own house just going Psh, whatever like oh someone's photographed whatever you know like no one does that because they have a kind of weird they have a, an intimacy with their these possessions. They're yours and they belong to you. And so he Im, intim, he implemented the put back system. So now you notice when you play Gone Home that everything once you've picked it up, you can put back exactly where it came from. And that's like a really important kind of amazing sort of way that they like implemented intimacy in their their games. So it was super interesting. Tony, could you advance the slide? Thank you. Okay, so. Um, there's three games on the slide, so clockwise um, from the top left. So we have uh, Another World, uh, again, Kara's game, Sacrilege, and at the bottom, uh, Ico. So do, would, do you want to start with? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll start with um, Another World because I want to talk a little bit about something that I kind of call 
intersubjective intimacy. Intersubjectivity is a kind of psychology, like a psychology term for um, like when there's like psychic energy that passes between two people and you kind of understand something. Like it's like a, a thing that happens like with intimacy with some a person. So you like uh, just a feeling of intimacy or um, y where you kind of both know what your like your emotions are at that point. Um, and there's a point at which in another world where um, you're in a cage uh, with like this kind of strange alien being, and you the uh, you basically swing the cage. You can swing the cage, and eventually you realize you can swing the cage, so it'll let you out. Um, and you break out of the cage. And you also break this alien out of the cage as well at the same time. And there's this beautiful moment, and it's a scripted event where it's like, mi like maybe a few seconds long, where um, you kind of think to yourself, oh, you know, the alien's going to run off or whatever now, and it's going to be great. But actually what happens is um, it's scripted that, you're, uh, that the alien sort of like pats you on the shoulder, I think it is, or like motions towards you. And from that moment on, you know that that alien feels like he owes you something, and so he's along for the ride. He's going to help you out. And you feel this moment of intimacy with another character that's like quite profound and really beautiful. And I feel like, actually, um, like those moments are usually missing in video games, but when they are there, they're really profound and really interesting, and they're the moments that people remember. And so, I mean, I also find um, with Team Ico's work, like Ico and uh, Shadow of the Colossus, you, the memorable things about those games are the, that you have to hold the girl's hand all the way through Ico, right? And that you have this, like, you have to take care of her. And in uh, Shadow of the Colossus, you also have this, like, feeling like when with with your horse. You have an intimacy with a horse in that game. And when the horse goes, like, goes missing, you feel devastated as a player. You feel loss. And it's because you both experience something together and you both have this intersubjective intimacy where you both know something about the, the world that you're experiencing and it's a thing that, about togetherness. And um, I guess to a certain extent as well, um, sacrilege also explores this idea that you and another person might try to know where you both are in a relationship, but um, for whatever reason, that's a kind of weird mismatch. And like what you're both really looking for, I mean, what the main character is looking for is intimacy with another person. But what happens is that sex isn't c giving that intimacy um, to a, a particular, the way that that person wanted. And so it's kind of a really nice um, sort of exploration about how heterosexuals like constantly, constantly do not communicate in an efficient way with each other. Um, and so, yeah, there's a kind of awareness of like the fact that if you want that kind of profound intimacy, intimacy that you're like searching for, then you have to do it through lots of different ways, including like, you know, like gestures and uh, words and like actually communicating with each other. So it's interesting. Oh, I forgot I was going to make that great joke about if you're straight and I'm gay, does that make this talk by? Yeah, this talk is is yeah. is like that's exactly it I, it's, it's exactly fifty percent yeah, straight. Yeah. Um, okay, you can applaud that yeah. joke. That's really it's a great on. joke, right? It's a it's it's a it's a bisexual it's better than talk. hard time. Come on, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, because we've got a few minutes and we want to do a couple questions really quick. Um, we're just going to talk about the future of sex in games really quickly as we see it. Uh, so this is a game called Luxury Superbia by Aria Harvey. Um, and her partner, Michael, um, Aria's keynote was in this room last year, and it was fantastic. Um, so I think touch technologies are really interesting, um, a really interesting space to think about sex and games. Uh, Luxurious Superbia is a very non-representative game. It's about, well, it's like, <laughs> well, I say that, but you're careening down a tunnel, stroking the sides of it. So it's a little yonic, um, a little bit. Um, but it's not, you're not touching a representation of a human body, right? You're try, it's trying to create this sense of connection or of eroticism um, between you and the game and sort of commenting on like the relationship between players and their devices as well because it is a touchscreen game. It's sort of like thinking about the semi-erotic connections we have to like these things that we carry everywhere. Um, and to me, this is a really fascinating approach and it's more fascinating than a lot of the things that I've seen in VR. And I think when we think about sex in games, there's this really unproductive, kind of boring approach that's like, oh my god, did you guys see the, did you guys see Demolition Man? We can totally do that with Oculus. Wouldn't that be cool? And it's like, 
that is actually kind of terrifying to me. Um, <laughs> like, I think there's so much that we still can explore around, like, because so few games have involved sex or intimacy, I think this sort of uh, idea that technology is going to make things better is, like, we, we've only scratched the surface of things that we can do with, like, mice and keyboards and text, even. So, yeah. I think we're pretty fixated on, like, bodies and sex and, like, images of bodies that we, you know, we would never usually think of, like, sex as being, looking like this game. And I think it's super interesting that they manage to explore sex without actually, like, you know, fixating on genitals again. Like, everyone always does that. And it's like, right, yeah. yeah, maybe we should get away from genitals to actually, like, turning each other on, you know? Um, but, yeah, there's also um, a feeling of... Um, have we got another slide for the like community yeah. side? Awesome. Yeah, so um, we were going to talk a little bit about um, the fact that um, there's, like, basically... It, Community is the future of um, sex in, in video games simply because um, like both me and Merritt have been like doing a lot of work with like curation and essentially um, making people aware that like games can address these topics and they can do them really really well and we're like kind of underserving ourselves if we don't try to explore like the whole range of like humanity with our uh, video games and so. Um, Merritt's been doing Forest, Forest Ambassador, which is an incredible like, sort of curation work where she. Um, she basically chooses a lot, well, you can explain it, but like she chooses a lot of um, video games that are like more accessible um, and that you can just sort of like load up instantly and they're like these like lovely little things. Like, um, I guess uh, you've been doing lots of like stuff with Twine and um, things like that. And then also um, Sexy is a column that I do uh, on Rock, Paper, Shotgun, which um, it's the best, the best named column in I the whole video games. I just got that. I've been pronouncing it S dot E X E for like a year now. I so mean, it is. You. Yeah, I mean, it is. You can say it whatever way you like, but it is the best named column in all of video games. And uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so I, I actually like the coolest thing I find with sexy is that people d weren't aware that like games were approaching sex other than like the kind of gross stuff that we normally. Uh, it, like hear about um, that the sensationalist stuff, and so I started it just because I felt like there are all these games that we we people don't know about, and when I started writing it, um, I had like no idea that. Um, what would happen eventually is that people started making games for me <laughs> to be included in this column, but also it, it, it kind of indicated that. Wait, 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 Kara. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> I'm really sorry. That's really <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, I mean, I this uh, this one is called "Come Together." This uh, column, so I God mean, damn it, <laughs> um, so anyway, <laughs> but the thing is that like that's totally true, and <laughs> but the thing is like it it started to be a community. Like people started to understand that there were other people that they could talk about and make games with, and like there were, there was actually a place that they could. Um, sort of like find community and find places to talk about this sort of stuff that was that actually like legitimized that kind of game and so actually like in future i feel like people will start to like make more of these kind of games just simply because Merritt and i and other people are curating things are interested in these things so that's kind of exciting i think yeah um and then i have a slide of, or an image of hio up there if you don't know hio is like a a site that's sort of like boomed in popularity over the past year. It's sort of like an alternative portal or platform for uploading your games and selling them. Um, th there's an interesting comparison made between itch.io and Steam with regards to sexual content. So itch runs on PayPal for the most part, and there's like questions around PayPal. Like PayPal, you can't use for like adult content, but usually what they mean by that is like porn of actual people. So like erotica, like tons of people sell erotica um, through itch, through PayPal and like other things. So th there's kind of like a gray line, but people are definitely like using that to to sell or showcase their work. Um, so I guess just okay. So um, this was. Uh, a Vine that Robert Yang posted of his game that went viral and um, had like millions of, of loops. So if you can imagine Robert's hand flying across the screen slapping that guy's ass to Bratmobile's cherry bomb in your head <laughs> with your mind.